Okay, so let's start. I just uh, uh, begin in French. Bonjour et bienvenue à tout le monde à ce deuxième colloque sur la thématique Healthy Aging, um, qui était organisé par uh, mon collègue Yvon Chaud et moi-même. Et aujourd'hui, nous aurons le plaisir d'écouter la professeure Diana Kou, et je vais passer à l'anglais pour la présenter. So I had the pleasure to introduce Professor Ku, who is now a emeritus professor of life course epidemiology at University College London. Uh, she initially trained as an economist and then began her career in epidemiology. And she made a very impressive career at University College London by creating and directing the unit for lifelong health and aging. She produced a broad range of publications, among which a famous book entitled A Life Course Approach to Chronic Disease Epidemiology. And this book contributed <coughs> sorry, to disseminating knowledge in this field by showing how chronic diseases have their origins in early life. She also conducted the National Survey of Health and Development, which is a British birth cohort study. And today she will summarize some evidence from this British birth cohort uh, using the life course approach and linking it to healthy aging in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Professor Ku, the floor is yours and we are very happy to re hear your presentation. Well, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. And um, uh, it's strange not to be able to see you all in the audience. So. Um, Let's hope that uh, you this is what you're expecting. So I'm going to talk about a life course approach to healthy aging, but I want in the second half to talk a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic may affect um, life course, um, how we approach life course epidemiology. So I'm going to um, introduce four phases of life course epidemiology uh, and uh, talk about the last uh, two, really. Uh, as, and also introduce my, the, Na the National Survey of Health and Development uh, very briefly so that you understand a, a little better some of the evidence I can show you. So, and I'm going to particularly talk about phase three, about functional trajectories and aging, which has been very topical in life course epidemiology since 2008. And then uh, we're just thinking at the moment about phase four, uh, which is to me would be the value of life course epidemiology in an age of pandemics and other global challenges. And I want to raise some of those things in the second half of the talk. So for those of you who don't uh, know much about life course epidemiology, it's the study of biological, behavioral and psychosocial pathways that link physical and social expo exposures during gestation, childhood, adolescence and adult life, and, and indeed across generations. To, to chronic disease uh, and other aspects of adult health. And it's important because it provides etiological insights into lifelong health and evidence for the type and timing and targeting of interventions. So there's been a series of uh, books as well as many, many papers that have come out of the work we've done. Um, and you mentioned very kindly the uh, life course approach to chronic disease epidemiology. Um, but I'm going to concentrate more on aging in this one. So taking a life course approach needs, you need to have uh, life course studies. Uh, in the UK, we have a wealth of uh, cohort studies, uh, birth cohort studies. Uh, and we also have um, a his, what we call historical cohort studies. So at the top few lines, you can see NSHD. That's the study that I worked on for 30 years and directed for 10 and shows that the, this slide is maybe slightly out of date, so there might be a few more data collections on the right-hand side now for these studies. Uh, and then there are th several national British birth cohort studies, the ALSPAC study, uh, which was a big regional study, and so on. And then the historical cohorts were where we had information uh, uh, from early life, different ages at early life, or, or even um, you know, right during pregnancy, and then then later on in life, these these cohorts were followed up and revitalized to try and test associations between what they'd experienced very early in life and later life. So, um, just so you know a little bit about the MRC National Survey of Health and Development, 
So it was uh, it was originally a maternity survey of all the births in a week in March 1946. Uh, but they took a sample for follow up and that was followed up. Well, I said 24 times. It's now there's been 25. It's been a more difficult for um, lately because of COVID, but they have done some uh, COVID uh, postal questionnaires lately. Um, not I'm no longer involved with the study, but um, and one of the things about this cohort is the very high response weight rate of around 80% we've always been able to achieve. Uh, always addressed science and policy, so and so be, being interested in the interplay between social and biomedical factors. Uh, first of all, obviously, years ago and over 70 years ago on pregnancy and childbirth, and then on um, in childhood and adolescence, and uh, and and then into adult health and function. And we've specialized in these various aspects of adult health and function, cardiovascular, respiratory, cognitive, musculoskeletal, uh, and with repeat measures. Um, and uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about that later on. And then we did a big clinic data collection in their 60s um, and another home visit at 69. Um, and then we at, it, we started before, while I was a director um, doing a neuroscience clinical sub study. So it was quite a few of our study members now have brain have had brain scans, and that's continuing. They've been having repeat brain scans uh, until the COVID uh, pandemic stopped that happening. And just to show how just the sort of how it, um, the response, and we've been very carefully looking after these study members. So you can see over the years just how high the response rates um, were. Uh, I was kind of concerned when they got into their uh, 70s that I would um, that they the, their response rate might start to drop off. But actually, uh, we got over 90 percent at the last uh, data collection we did with them, and I did with them. So in life course epidemiology, go, I mean there was. The importance of early life adult health was actually uh, conventional wisdom 100 over 100 years ago, uh, but it fell out of favor um, as the uh, epidemics of heart disease and uh, cancer and things came um, in the more sort of 30s and post-war period. Um, and so for a while, little attention was played to uh, the importance of early life, but there was this scattered evidence from the 1970s. And the only two ones I want to pick out here are the ones that uh, are the study, the NSHD actually um, led on. One was um, about how uh, when the children were infant, when they were infants and they, if they had bad, bad chest illness then, that they, in their 20s and 30s, they were already having worse lung function. Um, and that was something I'm going to come back to because we've obviously followed them up further now. And the other um, one that was uh, very early on in the um, from our study was the sh how we showed that low birth weight was linked to higher blood pressure, uh, which Michael Wadsworth, my predecessor, showed in 1985. And of course, it was in the 1980s that um, uh, we started to really revive the whole idea of life course um, epidemiology. And the catalyst for that, I don't know how many of you have heard of David Barker, unfortunately no longer with us, but who's, who, who had the hypothesis about the initially the fetal origins of adult disease. So just one slide on the phase one, so you understand how we get to phase three and four. So the revival in the 80s and 90s of life course epidemiology was prompted by David Barker's work on those historical cohort studies showing that uh, various indicators of poor growth um, in either in during gestation or in very early life had um, um, they had higher risks of cardiometabolic. Um, outcomes in later life and were more likely to have died when they had tried to follow up this cohort. And we were really fascinated with that. So the original book that came out at that time uh, in phase one, where we tried to review all the evidence uh, and replicate um, what had David had found, we linked the fetal origins of adult disease with adult lifestyle and social causation models. So how did they integrate and uh, operate uh, all of those on uh, your later life health. Um, 
initially people thought these associations were confounded by socioeconomic position. Um, mostly they were not. Um, so there was a lot of testing of those. And we increasingly looked more and more at the postnatal environment and then at adult mediators and modifiers. And over time, I mean, David actually was a supervisor for my PhD, so we argued a lot, but at the, over time it became a, a developmental origins of health and disease was the sort of Barker take, which um, wasn't just about fetal life, it was about um, sort of uh, also early postnatal uh, growth and, and, and change. But his theory was always about nutritional deficiencies. And one of the things I want to uh, link later on with COVID is at the time when other people were looking at this in then doing reviewing the evidence for the first time, particularly in the States, there was a, um, a lot of interest in early infectious diseases in childhood and how that might play out in later life. And, you know, some of them go back a long, a long way, like um, uh, streptococcal infection and rheumatic heart disease, for example. I don't have time to go into it. So the second phase was when we really started to develop life course epidemiology as a research field, which was really from about 2002. We had a second edition of the book. We had a book on women's health. We applied the life course approach to many other health outcomes. Um, we developed conceptual life course models to try and um, distinguish between what we called critical and or sensitive period models when uh, a, a period either in early life or in another time of uh, rapid change might have um, a bigger impact on later life than the same exposure at other times, or whether this was about accumulation that you just got people had certain people had lots of bad things happening to them and it just accumulated risk, or whether certain types of exposures led to other kinds of exposures and chains of risk. And this was important because it matters where you actually intervene and whether you can stop a chain of risk or or whether you can you know um, reduce the critical or sensitive period the other thing that happened in this time was there was much more evidence synthesis cross cohort analyses i'll mention one or two later on systematic reviews meta analyses because there is, you have to be able i mean it's all very interesting to show it in one cohort but the critical thing is does this um, uh, does the evidence actually go across the cohorts? And if it varies, why does it vary? So there was a lot of that. And also, because we wanted to look at lifelong health um, before many diseases were manifest, uh, there was increasing focus on functional change and growth trajectories uh, and, and sensitive periods beyond infancy. And I'm going to um, sort of talk a little bit and give you some more evidence about what I call phase three, which was when we really got into um, studying aging. Um, so, so first this focus on lifetime functional trajectories, which I'll come back to, was a way of looking at health across life and focus on integrating life course epidemiology with aging research. We got, uh, we worked very closely with quite a lot of people who were very interested in aging and we're looking back to see in later life and looking back to see how things earlier in life might have affected it, particularly people like Luigi Ferrucci from the NIA in, in America. And in fact, you know, one definition that's pretty accepted, I think, of aging is that it's a progressive generalized impairment of function. And so by looking at different aspects of function across life, showing how it may be affected by factors in earlier life, we were really contributing something new to the aging uh, debate. And there was, and still is, I think, there was even then endless debate about how to um, define healthy aging or have some global measure of aging. And we took a very pragmatic ap approach. Um, we focused on what we called optimal functioning for the maximal period of time. And that was broken down into three areas, physical and cognitive capability, body, uh, so at the individual level, because we felt mobility and cognition were really key aspects for individuals about being able to lead autonomous and, healthy and, and, and good lives as they got older. And then the body systems level, and then more and more, we were looking at the cellular and molecular levels. And... And one of the interesting things for us to do was to look at how those different levels actually interrelated and not only interrelated with each other, but also then how 
measuring function at different ages would actually affect your chance of survival to old age, would actually affect when you had the onset um, and the, uh, and the um, rate of decline um, or in, in chronic diseases. Um, so, and all those things tend to interrelate quite strongly. We absolutely separated off the kind of well-being side, the positive emotional health and participation in valued roles, uh, because there was already quite a lot of evidence that that has a more U-shaped relationship with age. So you're actually, your well-being is lowest in, in, in midlife. And in fact, as you retire, as I have, my well-being has shot up and I'm hoping it will stay that way. So we need to look at how those two things, how the well-being and what I would call the biological aging interact, but they don't necessarily have the same trajectories. So if we look only at more the sort of functioning of body systems like um, uh, muscle strength or lung function, you've probably seen this um, diagram many times before, uh, but I think it's a very useful diagram because for many aspects of function, you get this rapid acceleration of growth to young adulthood, and then you get uh, hopefully a maintenance of that function for a while, but then uh, inevitably some decline. And obviously, you want to have the highest peak function and the slowest rate of decline, and that will mean you're less likely to reach the threshold when you're older, when limitations uh, uh, will occur. Um, and early life risk factors are important because they not only um, drive whether you reach your peak, uh, but we were interested, were they going to, uh, as we got more repeat measures, did they actually drive the rate of decline of function in, in later life? Whereas adult risk factors can really only affect the rate of decline. So in this period, the key aspects, the key questions we were looking at was, what was the relationship between function and subsequent disease, disability, frailty, well-being? How do those different aspects of function change and covary across life? Uh, whether there were gender, socioeconomic, ethnic or cohort differences, and during which period of life are important changes observed? And what factors across life are associated both with level and then with change in function? And of course, when the ultimate question is when in life will interventions have the greatest impact on maintaining function? And I think it's just worth saying here to link to your speaker from last week from WHO. Um, we use the term capability for the top level, individual level functioning, and then body systems under that. Um, I'm very happy to call it capacities. I think that came later, really, and the whole idea of intrinsic capacities and what were the key ones. So um, both the, the body systems level and the physical and cognitive capability, you can think of them as ca capacities as um, as described in the WHO reports on, on, on aging. So we, d we mustn't get too wound up about terminology for these things. And so the public health strategy for healthy aging using a life course approach is to, first of all, find ways to enhance reserve and then to maintain function and delay disease onset and slow down the, the de uh, decline and disease progression. And I believe quite a lot of work is now being done on disease progression, which is I, I'm not up to date on that, but I think that's a really interesting area, too. So. The measures, the kind of measures of physical and cognitive capability that we used um, in the um, NSHD uh, were very simple things. They had, we had to do them initially, we were only doing them in people's homes with nurses. So just as you heard last week, um, hand grip strength has become a, a, a big measure, uh, walking speed and chair rises. We got people to stand on one leg, uh, first with their eyes open and then with their eyes closed. And closing your eyes makes it almost impossible, but it's a really good thing to be practicing, especially during the pandemic. Um, and we uh, did, and then we also did some measures of dexterity at some points. And on the cognitive measures, we did uh, verbal memory using wordless tasks, processing speed using a letter cancellation task, and verbal fluency. And so just to give you an example here, 
uh, at this time, we were really into doing systematic reviews and meta analyses. And first of all, uh, Rachel Cooper, who worked with me for very closely for a long time, did a, a wonderful um, systematic review uh, looking at uh, grip strength and walking speed and chair rise time. And the ones that wasn't enough evidence for balance at that time, we did that later. And showing how uh, the lower the or the slower the speed, the lower the strength, uh, the the greater risk of 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 mortality. And she went on to do also share that with morbidity, and then to show in our own cohort later on um, the importance of the balance test too for later uh, mortality. So. And there's much many other uh, evidence from many other cohorts showing that these tests uh, do have um, um, do relate to these uh, more um, these more out these outcomes of later life. So I just wanted to show you some trajectories, for example, of uh, strength and walking speed and blood pressure, so you can see um, that, that have been done in different ways. But you can see the at least for three of them this kind of uh, lifetime trajectory of rise and then gentle fall. Um, the one by Dodds uh, was actually putting together, uh, I think, 12 of the cohort data over different, which had studied it over different times. The one on the right um, is the Fell study, which you can actually show differences in birth cohorts over time. Um, the walking speed was the Baltimore study of aging that um, Luigi Ferrucci did with us. Um, and that's very it. And I, in fact, quite a lot of the physical functioning, I think, shows this where you get quite a high maintenance across until about 60, 65 and then a more accelerated decline. I'm showing the blood pressure partly to show how the uh, cross cohort work we did with blood pressure, um, showing this uh, rise, steep rise in blood pressure in childhood, and then slightly leveling off, and then a increase again in midlife, and then a drop off in in later life. And you could argue that that doesn't look like any of the other trajectories, but I think if you think about art arterial elasticity, um, you actually might get a phenotype that's more like what you get for grip and lung and um, walking speed. But that we can discuss that. So then moving on to the uh, a question, you know, one of our main questions, well, what factors across life explain the variation? And I'm going to use physical capability as my main example here. So that's all the different, um, you know, balance and chair rises and grip strength that we measured. And in one thing I'm going to show you as you go through is as we go through is how common the some of these factors are across the different outcomes. And I want to come back to that later on. So the sort of pre adult factors, uh, I'm not going to read them out, but you can see that to do with social, uh, the social environment to do with growth and maturation to do with motor development and cognitive development. And um, I'll come back to that in just a minute. And then a whole range of other um, papers that were written to show the importance of um, more these adult factors from health behaviors and body size right through to um, some of the underlying mechanisms that we were able to uh, measure while in the in the last uh, sort of 10 years of, of, of it, when the study members were in their 60s, hopefully not the last 10 years, hopefully they'll be followed until they're 100. And more and more bringing in genetic and epigenetic factors. So just to look at lifetime social inequalities in functional aging, um, so, and here or across the slide, what you can see are, so you've got lung function, FEV1 indicator, FBC. You've got the other chair rises, grip strength, standing balance, um, uh, the get up and go measure, which is on some of the other cohorts, uh, verbal memory, and then the mental ones. And all what I want you to just take from there is that this is the childhood um, socioeconomic uh, position, we're comparing the top and the bottom of the scale of childhood hi social hierarchy. And so each of these factors is related to um, childhood social position. Uh, and some of them are so there's a like a, if it goes 1.1, that says there's a 10% difference between the top and the bottom. Um, so you can see it varies, but there's still people who came from had a poor start to life in our cohort. Uh, did have worse physical, cognitive, and um, 
uh, and physical um, functioning. And it was very similar to the adult pattern, using adult socioeconomic pattern. Uh, and we explored all sort of kinds of pathways that might explain that, but it includes, and they are not mutually, there isn't just one pathway, and I'll come back to these pathways, but education, cognitive development, body size, all important mediators of these associations. And then just to show you the sort of meta-analysis we did with childhood socioeconomic position and walking speed, again, a, a systematic a meta-analysis here, um, showing that uh, lower childhood uh, socioeconomic uh, position and slower walking speed at different ages in the different cohort studies. Um, in su there were fewer studies that could look at early development, um, but uh, and I think I just want to raise here the difference between because not everything comes out the same, and it's quite interesting to see why what's going on. So grip strength. Um, has actually quite an um, not, uh, interesting association with birth weight, both in men and women. And also, in men, during puberty, the, as they have actually weight gain in our cohort, which was in men mostly a gain in muscle, as well as fat, it wasn't so much fat as muscle, <laughs> you can see had a, between 7 and 15, also had a strong positive relationship with grip strength. In comparison, the sort of tests which have a more neurological component, chair rising and standing, standing balance in particular, they were positively associated with growing well sort of pre-puberty. Uh, and then for women in particular, anything from puberty onwards um, had weight gain, had a negative association. There was also a positive association with infant motor development and childhood motor coordination and cognitive ability. So those more CNS um, uh, factors were, uh, if you had um, you had those, they were more likely to have better chair rising, standing balance at, um, at certainly in midlife. And in fact, I'm going to show you how it changed in later life. So out of this sort of data and evidence, one could raise the idea was it wasn't just about neurodegeneration here. We needed to look at how neurodevelopment as well. And some people have gone on uh, to do that. Uh, and this is just a meta-analysis of the birth weight and grip strength. I'm, I'm not, I won't talk about that. It's, um, uh, but that was, a, th those were the kind of things we put together to show that it wasn't just, um, you know, in one cohort. So what the last paper I wrote on grip strength um, in 20, came out in 2018, was we finally had three measures so we couldn't look at, we couldn't look at any sort of quadratic function. We couldn't look at the curve but we could at least look at change over time in a linear fashion. And so I just put here, because I'm going to compare it with the cognitive measures, uh, cognitive outcomes, uh, the kind of things that affected uh, grip strength. Um, it, it, so you get a, you know, what affects all those three measures of grip strength and sort of overall association. And then you can look at what affects the change. So, Anything with a star on here means that not only does it affect grip strength, the level of grip strength, uh, uh, it also affects the change. So, for example, just so you understand this, being male, I mean, we all know men have stronger grip strength. There's no um, question of that. But actually, as they age, they lose um, strength faster than women lose strength. So they are actually getting closer together as they get older. And in fact, grip strength is quite an interesting um, uh, one of the differences was with grip strength, some of the measures of, for example, with neuro, um, the cognitive, with the early cognitive measures, they weren't very apparent at 53. They were much stronger for things like standing balance and um, chair rises. But as people aged, then these early factors to do with um, neurodevelopment and um, socioeconomic position began to really um, play out. So what I've shown you on the right hand on the graph here is the if you look at the green line that crosses the other two lines, that's actually um, the people with the higher level of childhood cognition. And you'll see that when they were 53, they actually had a slightly lower um, uh, grip strength. 
but over time between up to 69 they were actually uh, declining their grip strength was declining at a slower rate than the group who had um, lower levels of cognition and we found that for um, the, those measure that measure and also for um, the social class measures um, so you can see a whole range right across life a whole range of lifetime determinants and I think Oh, uh, yeah, no. Um, so just if you keep some of those in mind and you can ask me about any of them, but obviously I can't go into the details of all of those. So I wanted then just to also show I thought this was a really important update to the lung function trajectories and hopefully they'll be also doing it. If this went up to um, 64, 65, where we had again, three measures. And this was very interesting to me, because if you remember, we had that early data right back in the 70s that um, chest illness and early disadvantage was having an effect on the when the adults were in their 20s and 30s on their uh, respiratory symptoms and then their lung function and what we found here was that um, the biggest um, impact on your lung function you know one of the biggest environmental impacts is obviously if you smoke so those two lower lines, the red line and the purple line, are the smokers. Uh, and they've got two indicators here, FEV1 and FVC, two measures of lung function. And what you see as uh, those in that, you can see the smokers are declining much faster than the people who uh, are, are not, um, were not smokers. And you can also see that the difference between um, the purple and the red line, um, I don't know whether I can show it or if my, can you see that? Can you see my, um, yeah. That that difference is bigger than that, that is between the most disadvantaged childhood socioeconomic, well, not just socioeconomic, it included all the early disadvantage of various kinds, including the chest illness. And um, so the difference was much greater, whereas for the non-smokers, the difference, it was still there, but it was much smaller. These at the top, these two lines at the top. And the respiratory physicians we were working with felt that one of those likely explanations was this, that uh, in this cohort, people, quite a lot of people started smoking quite early in their teens. And that if you started smoking early or started smoking in your teens, you were less likely to be able to catch up the deficit that you had from early life. Um, it was, you know, like a double whammy uh, on your lung function. So I thought that was a really interesting. Um, I mean, one of the things of working on a study so long is you get a chance to really go back and look at uh, how things have changed over time. And I just think that's the most fascinating element to me at the moment. So if you can remember the risk factors for physical capability. Here are the ones for adult verbal memory. Again, the stars are the, um, mean the change. In fact, very little in cognitive um, outcomes in later life were, ex uh, you, there were very little, few factors that we found that could explain the change. Uh, one of them was your healthy life, having a healthy lifestyle did, was certainly helpful at maintaining your cognition over time. And the other one, interesting one, was APOE status, which we had at that time, which is shown in the lower graph. And that's interesting because um, cohorts had got inconsistent evidence relating APOE status to cognitive um, outcomes. And what, what you see here and what you see in other genetic factors we've looked at is they have different impact at different ages. So, in fact, the APOE status only really started to manifest itself um, after the age of um, 50, and then it, the, it, it increased. So the people with the, uh, the variant that's um, linked to uh, poorer cognitive outcomes, you can see is getting, um, the differences are getting wider here. Um, and, but as we all know, these are the different, um, in the top graph, these are the three different tertiles of um, education. And you can see how they relate to this. And here we've got four measures. So you can see how, like with many measures of function after about 65, I'm very much on a downward slope now being 68, uh, not 16, yeah, 68. Um, uh, you start to have that accelerated decline. But if you look over the left, you still have relationships with this time females are doing better. 
than males. Um, please remember that. We have better verbal memory in adult life. Um, so there are certain things like childhood measures of growth and cognition that are, that are kind of similar. And then there's and social class and education um, and healthy lifestyle measures. But there are also ones that uh, you didn't see in the physical capability, things to do with ado adolescent self-organization. Um, uh, we also found um, a link with age at menopause, for example, which we didn't really find with physical capability. So, but there's some of these common um, risk factors. Um, and then just to kind of complete the aspects of healthy aging, this is healthy aging as survival, again, only from our cohort this time. But again, looking again, you'll see very similar measures. Um, so this is following uh, cumulative mortality by sex and social childhood social class on the top line. This blue line at the top figure are women born into a non-manual class. Um, and uh, so they are doing particularly well in that early post-war cohort. Uh, compared to their uh, female, their peers who were born into a non-manual class. For the men, the differences only started to emerge um, after the age of 60. The other thing just to point out here in this one um, was how this is taking the verbal memory score at 53. Oh, no, 40, 43, sorry. And showing how over time in tertiles of that memory, in thirds of that memory score, that um, this is related to uh, a higher risk of mortality, the lower the cognition in midlife. So what we were finding in a, which I'm only just showing you one example here, were early life factors affecting midlife function and then midlife function um, often having a major, quite a major impact on later health, even in later life. How am I doing for time? Okay. And then I mentioned how healthy aging being in terms of optimal well-being is probably quite different. Here's the U-shaped um, with one indicator of well-being, U-shaped measure with age. And it's related, well, um, healthy well-being to um, biological aging. Here we've looked at clinical disorders in the bottom one. And there is a relationship, but basically it's the top and the bottom, the ones who have no disorders and the ones who have five or more clinical disorders have the real difference. And in, in the middle period, uh, there's not so much variation in well-being. So, uh, in their very different kinds of risk factors here, which I'm not going to go into. All right. So in my last uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to, uh, I want to talk to you a bit more about how we bring code into this. So usually I show this life course pathways right at the beginning, but I wanted to show you here because I want you to think about how uh, the early environment um, actually does end up affecting all these, and I've put down all the NSHD outcomes in this right-hand box that we have published about to show all the different aspects, uh, including things, a whole range on cardiometabolic outcomes, for example, and bones and body composition, thyroid, renal disorders, which I don't have time to show you. So what you're trying to distinguish is is are the pathways through because people born into a poor environment tend to end up in a poor environment in adult life? Is it through education? Uh, they get worse education. Uh, is it through behaviors which start in childhood or the behaviors in adult life? Is it through physical growth, maturation, you know, the cognitive and emotional development that we've been showing you some associations with? Um, so trying to unpack that is what we're trying to do. And more and more, we were measuring these biological mechanisms to try and understand um, what might be the main underlying mechanisms linking, um, say, the early environment to later life health. Now, that's very on a birth cohort. That's if you look at this, which we I redrew to put into a EU report in June 2019, a SAPIA report. We try to extend the life course approach to include uh, the macro, physical and social environment. And I'm not sure this figure is quite right yet, but you can see down below under birth cohort, you've got all the same aspects. I'm using capacity here, so just to go with the WHO, but you've got the same pathways to look at. Uh, but what you're trying to incorporate are the global challenges. Um, 
the physical and the macro social environment. And I give you some examples up there. And we were particularly interested in this report on things like climate change, environmental pollution, and antimicrobial resistance. And we finished the report just as the COVID pandemic um, uh, was starting, but we were, it was before we knew anything about that. So what we what what do we need to now think about? Um, because these particularly these the global physical challenges are becoming more and more uh, um, urgent to address. So the questions I think um, the life course epidemiology will have to really address will be what will be the likely long term consequences of the COVID pandemic on population health and which are likely to be the important pathways. And I think it's worth going back to learn what we can from previous pandemics. And my co-author, uh, so we've got a chapter in preparation, and my co-author, Joe Blodgett, Blodge um, has been back to look at, if you look at even, for example, the Spanish flu, we now have quite interesting census data from the US showing how those who were in utero during the Spanish flu had uh, a number of poorer adult health outcomes, premature mortality, for uh, um, education and um, sort of career achievements. Um, and you can look at the SARS and MERS, uh, which you can also, um, you know, a lot of the factors that are coming to about COVID, uh, like brain fog, um, respiratory damage, lung damage, those kind of things were also being picked up in um, these previous um, zoonotic diseases. So I think we need to go back and learn from those. I think um, the how and why the long term consequences of the pandemic may vary by age and cohort has to be further addressed. I mean, we clearly know age is an incredibly important factor for the severity of the illness. Um, but uh, if you're looking at the pan, uh, it's the severity of the illness, but if you're looking at the impact of the whole pandemic, you're thinking about not just being ill, but also all the disruption of the lockdowns and potentially the economic recession um, and all the changes in society that are going on. So you could argue that whereas the older adults, there's a real risk of mortality, the younger, the younger um, or the teen teenagers and the young adults, more risk of disrupted education and worse socioeconomic outcomes, which again will affect their health in later life. And maybe in the middle ages, you know, you've got the real danger of long COVID, I think, for a lot of people. So trying to unpack that's going to be very important. And then looking to see how those earlier life biological, psychological or socioeconomic factors may affect or modify these immediate and long term consequences of the pandemic. And we know a little bit about that already. And I was just going to show you a little bit about what we know. Um, before I finish. So uh, I think I've shown you and I think you know anyway from many other bits of evidence that living conditions, um, poor living conditions uh, and lifetime poor living conditions adversely affect aging outcomes. And I think I'm using living conditions now because I, I hear just wanting to cover both socioeconomic but also uh, poor social in quality of in interactions. So both adversity, both from material adversity and psychosocial adversity. And we know that the gro there's a growing evidence that uh, the more disadvantaged you are, the increases the exposure and the severity of COVID-19. So the pandemic, as I think everybody will know, has exposed and exacerbated these existing socioeconomic inequalities. And of course, they've been increasing over the last 30 years in rather a dramatic fashion. Um, and it's something that seems to be little political will at the moment to change. So the pandemic is also affecting the population. I mean, more people are living in poorer living conditions. They've lost more people in uh, lost employment in the lockdowns. There's been an increase in child poverty and food banks. All this is now being um, published. Uh, and of course, for some countries like the US, the cost of being ill with COVID have been quite astronomical and um, for, uh, for, for people. And then the pandemic has also disrupted local services um, for healthcare, education, 
decrease, decrease the qual level and quality of social interactions with probable long term consequences that way. And I haven't put all the references, but there are references for all these points. There's really an important need to look at educational attainment uh, as a sort of separate factor as well. It's a mediator of the link between living conditions and aging. Um, the pandemics really disrupted education. Again, it's exacerbated educational inequalities with long term consequences um, for uh, younger people. Uh, I think there's been an estimate of the effect on net earnings could be as much as in England, in the UK, they say it could be as much as 30 to 40,000 pounds over the lifetime. So potentially this could be a big impact. And then on the other thread, uh, the cognitive side, as opposed to the educational side, and there's a nice, interesting difference in that. Uh, we know, and I've shown you a little bit, that those childhood and adult cognitive capacities are associated with a range of outcomes. And we know COVID-19 is really is likely or may affect neurological processes, both in adults. Um, and I think, you know, people are beginning to sort of want to look at that in children as well. And again, do we need to look at neurodevelopment as well as neurodegeneration? This is a whole huge area that, um, you know, I'm just really just um, pointing out. The last couple of slides, I think I'm, hope I'm all right for time. If you think about the lifetime health behaviors that came up as a common risk factors, we know that these um, smoking, alcohol consumption, inactivity, et cetera, they, are, they, do, they um, do, it, it, you know, you need to, these adverse health behaviors can really uh, uh, accelerate your decline. We also know that many of these health behaviors are initiated in childhood and are lifelong. So there's the life course perspective before we even get COVID. But when COVID comes along, we find that the adverse health behaviors also increase the risk of COVID-19 and its severity. And in fact, in the little picture below, the vice versa is true, but I think this one is showing that, you know, the more if you've got good, good physical activity, that may modify the risk um, between the virus and, and, and the severity of the illness. So uh, health behaviors are going to be very important uh, both to look at the short and long term impact of the pandemic, both on risky behaviors. And I think more and more we'll be looking at preventive behaviors. You know, who are the people who are taking safe, doing the sort of safe behaviors? Um, and is that having a long term impact on their health? And we will need to jointly assess the impact of health behaviors and COVID-19 on aging outcomes. And this is where these cohorts, I mean, all these questions will rely on these cohort studies that have already got data on these um, measures and have many of the cohort studies in the UK and I hope in Europe and I suspect in Europe as well have been collecting measures on the COVID pandemic so that they can look at both. And then uh, I think what, lastly, the, I just think about health conditions over the lifetime. So we know that many of the health conditions in midlife they're very quite common in midlife for quite a lot of people. We know their origins of things like cardiometabolic um, problems, a uh, whole range of outcomes uh, of, of disorders lie in early life and the biological mechanisms are the focus of ongoing research. We know that BMI is a key pathway. <laughs> we know the higher BMI raises the risk for 20 age related chronic decision, uh, conditions. Over 50% of European adults are overweight or obese. We know that childhood obesity is increasing, as shown in our cross cohort work on the right. And we know, of course, all these things, pre-existing conditions and obesity, huge effect on the risk and severity of COVID-19. And how COVID-19 disturbs body systems and the underlying health conditions and obesity, uh, and how it may accelerate immunosenescence um, and causes respiratory and neurological damage you know, is a very um, topical area. Uh, and one of the things I've been interested in is looking at the immune function trajectory over life um, and what are the factors that really um, impinge on that at different stages. And again, in the future, we're going to have to look at the joint impact of pre-existing health conditions and COVID-19 on aging outcomes. So last two slides. So I'm still at a very early stage of thinking about what's the value of life course epidemiology in the age of pandemics and other global challenges. 
And I would say that there's a research priority to widen our gaze. So we need to have a greater focus on the dynamic interplay between these physical challenges, like pandemics, but all the others that I mentioned on my slide, the societal changes that are coming with it, and those individual life course determinants of aging, which we have focused on up till now. The other thing we really need to um, get uh, better at is the integration of life course and infectious epidemiology. Uh, restore the focus of the long term consequences of infectious diseases on aging and chronic diseases. Have a greater focus on lifetime determinants of risk and susceptibility to infectious diseases. And all of this will require us to make very good use of big data and analytical advances in both fields to assess cumulative lifetime exposures. Uh, um, in terms of timing, intensity, duration, the biological responses that individuals have to those exposures, and then investigate them in relation to aging and COVID-19. And these are some of the early papers that are starting to do that work. And then I thought I'd better end with key some key messages. Um, I hope I've given you enough evidence to uh, support these messages, but I would say that uh, in life course epidemiology, understanding the life course functional trajectories is key. We are definitely seeing transitions both in early life, but also there are some in 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 later life as well, like during during um, midlife for women, when exposures can have longer term consequences. We see these common risk factors time again: uh, lifetime socioeconomic disadvantage, disadvantage, poor childhood growth, or cognitive development, having an effect on survival, poorer function, greater risk of decline. We see that midlife uh, levels and accelerated decline in physical and mental function are also having an important um, effect on later life, um, on aging and later life health. So promotion of healthy aging needs to start early and continue across life. Of course, the sort of standard things of taking exercise and all that healthy lifestyle is going to be important to keeping your high level of function and lower chance of decline. So we mustn't, uh, we don't dismiss that. In fact, you know, we think that's very important too. And health professionals really need to intervene when there, when there is accelerated decline and not necessarily wait until clinical thresholds are reached. Because if we can identify people early, we can hopefully um, alter the, the trajectory. So I'm sorry if I've talked too fast. I wanted this was what I wanted to get through, and I thank you for listening. If you're interested, the late more recent stuff on life course epidemiology, there was a whole issue in the IJE in 2016, uh, which is worth um, a read. Um, and I take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Ku, for this uh, synthesis of evidence, which was really uh, uh, impressive from the beginning of, of life uh, until. Uh, old age, and uh, I don't know if there is any question. I saw one in the chat from Marianik. Uh, uh, I let you yeah. talk about it. Not know if it has been uh, answered or not. Yeah, um, yes, it was partly answered during the, the presentation, and I, I want to thank you first for this uh, very, very interesting presentation and very comprehensive one. Um, I'm not uh, totally familiar with the field, but I uh, work a little bit on uh, priority indicators uh, in, in, well, to assess the priority or to recognize priority mainly uh, in hospitals. And, uh, well, um, you talked about this association between uh, cognitive impairments and uh, physical impairments. Mm -hmm. And, for example, uh, grip strength is associated with some uh, cognitive deficiency. And I was wondering uh, what you would recommend as a good assessment tool for uh, well, maybe LC aging or the opposite uh, frailty in uh, older people. And um, sorry, but I, I take the advantage of the second question. Um, you, you talked about the societ societal uh, change during the COVID period, and uh, I read some uh, interesting paper about uh, some uh, increase in the desire to, uh, to, to die prematurely in elderly people. And uh, I wanted to, to ask you if you have any um, information, quantitative information about this phenomenon in England. And um, 
more especially um, you said that uh, this would impact the, the length of life or the, the life course in the future and and do you think that uh, we the the change in the way people will decide on their lengths of life will change in the near future uh, consequently to covid-19 okay i i think i've caught them I, what i wasn't sure about your first question was were you asking i think you were asking about what assessments would i suggest would be good to look at older people to assess their um, sort of, you know, uh, their 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 trajectories. Then, in order to improve yes. them, is that is that right? Yes. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So so um, as I um, there are people were like uh, there are geriatricians. We actually trained up loads of geriatricians. That was one of my focus um, uh, in the last few years. And um, there's been quite a lot of work I, um, by people like Avanaya Sayer. Um, and others, um, and we actually did write one paper looking at our own data to see what would be what what do GPs, what do general family doctors generally have at their disposal or could measure quite quickly to kind of assess uh, people, um, and would that have? And then we looked to see if that had an effect on their mobility decline. Um, and I'm just trying to, and so. The measures, the physical capability measures that I mentioned, the simple ones that, um, you know, like standing on one leg with your eyes closed and the chair rises and the grip strength are actually, um, they're, they, they, are, they are important for, I mean, they've been shown, for example, um, I know uh, to be important for whether people, how well people do when they have um, cancer treatment um so you know they they give a, a sort of a measure of of frailty a sort of early measure um that will will be kind of important for their both of them we found it for the mobility decline and uh for things like you know deciding whether for them to decide about their treatments and things um and one of the things i think in our paper we showed was we we looked to see whether you needed to you know, just take one of these measures, or was it beneficial to have all three measures? And the it's certainly the I think it's called the C statistic. I get I'm um, get old of this now, but the C it definitely improved when you had actually all three measures. But that was in our cohort. So I know there are a lot of papers being written or have been written to because people are saying how should we introduce these measures into that sort of assessment um, in mm -hmm. in early late life. Um, and my understanding is that um, there's a growing consensus that these measures are actually, along with measures like blood pressure or things that you automatically measure, uh, would be very would be very useful. Um, I don't know if I understand the second question about what's the phenomena. Is that about people themselves deciding the length of their lives and um, their, um, you know, and choosing to. Um, Finish their life when they want to. Is that what you're exactly? Because we we observed this phenomena in yes. uh, Switzerland, for example, where people asked for uh, uh, assisted suicide. Uh, all the people ask more for assisted suicide than uh, before. In fact, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I've noticed in the British papers, there's it's the assisted suicide has become um you know it goes up and down in how many articles get written about it and in the pandemic this has increased the number of articles again about it um i don't have any day i'm not aware of that evidence it's not something i've done it's actually something i feel quite uncomfortable about because i feel having sort of studied you know all these thousands of older as people as they get older i'm very aware that relationships between family members are quite difficult for many people and um and so it it's it's something i'm actually quite concerned about um and people have very different views and i really can't um i i there's nothing in our cohort and as far as i know there's nothing in other people's cohorts the only thing that we did which we had to do because we want to study people as they get dementia and some of our study members already have dementia and they have cognitive impairment. We did ask them in their early in their sixties. Um, we asked them very tactfully whether, if they were no longer able to give consent, would they want to stay in the study? 
and who would be their person who would represent them. And we did that towards the end of an interview when the nurse has got a very good relationship with them. And they were amazing. I mean, the vast majority that I think there was almost nobody who wanted to drop out um, a big, at that point. And um, at, over time, it's raising some interesting questions for the where the, you know, their sons and daughters maybe didn't even know they were in the study and sometimes have a different idea of what they they don't necessarily want their parents to continue. So in the in in our study, so getting that um, future consent has been very important, um, and I think that's the sort of questions that um, you know may well get introduced into the study in the near future. But I'm not responsible for that anymore. I'm afraid. So thanks thanks a lot for your answer. But I think it's it's an important fact, well, important point to uh, to study. Uh, because this COVID-19 has really impacted the psych psychiatric and psychological uh, uh, absolutely in in, absolutely. Yeah. in young and elderly people. Yes, and and you know the from the stories we hear uh, from our medical friends, you know, dying of COVID is not a very nice thing unless you've got very good medical care on hand to help. Um, and you know, nobody would want to go through that as far as so it may well affect how people. Um, want to, um, you know, whether they, whether if they get very bad COVID, they say, you know, don't ever put me on a ventilator or whatever. There, there's definitely, um, oh, actually interesting enough for the, in the Academy of Medical Sciences, to which, which I'm a member, and in the MRC, they have done, um, they were like pop-up um, shops to do with uh, to getting people to talk about death and dying and, and getting people to think about living wills and other things. and. They've actually been quite um, popular, if you can say that, um, as they've gone around the country. I was an advisor on those in terms of what you could ask and what you could talk about. So I think, you know, it's certainly becoming much more of a openly debated question in the UK. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your answers. Any other Thank questions? You. Yeah. I don't know. In the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, I read the comment from uh, Ritu Sadana on the chat. So she said she wrote excellent presentation with highly relevant studies highlighted pathways and key messages as expected from Professor Ku. Mm -hmm. Ah, you are online. <laughs> I don't know if whether we, you you are still here. So I I, I read it because probably Professor Ku did, doesn't uh, see the chat. No, I don't see the chat. <laughs> if there are any questions on the chat afterwards, you can send them to me and I'll try and answer them. But um, today I oh, felt it was better to give an over overview of, you know, where I thought, where we've come Pastor, from and I, where we're I going. I have a question. You, you mentioned uh, that during uh, adulthood, uh, no, during uh, the entire life, there were some critical periods. And then during adulthood, there was some theories of mm. other critical periods versus um, more uh, a theory of accumulation of, uh, yeah. of uh, positive yes. or negative determinants. And yeah. you mentioned also the, the menopause in women, but at the end, are there other more critical periods or does it uh, uh, um, go towards this theory of accumulations? I'm not uh, sure that's a very, I'm very, in, very interesting question, and I think it's um, it's different for different outcomes, basically. So, although most of the focus has been on, well, initially on in utero um, critical periods, but then clearly in childhood there were various sensitive periods that um, our cohort and other cohorts revealed. Um, there are people who, again, in you know, in at later in adolescence, and in terms of both. Um, sort of biological development in terms of brain development and in terms of sort of social transitions, that's also a very key time when factors that things that happen to you can have long term impact on your later life. Um, I, I think you could actually talk about midlife being generally, you know, there's quite now a lot of evidence about, you know, how you reach midlife um, and how, that's really going to play into your later life trajectory. And 
I, one of the things we were able to do in our cohort was to try and separate age effects from, in the women, uh, menopause effects. And I don't know about you, but there's yet again another barrage of books coming out on menopause, suggesting that everybody goes crazy during menopause, which I absolutely disagree with. Um, there's, but uh, we did have a very, uh, you know, there are one or two things that do seem to be um, impacted by the hormonal changes during menopause that do potentially have some small, but, you know, lifelong impact. And so I was interested um, as a completely separate thing in the women's health work I did. Um, I'd looked at, uh, I'd shown that childhood cognition with my colleagues, shown that childhood cognition higher childhood cognition was related to a uh, later age at menopause and the earlier the measure in childhood the stronger the association so, and basically it was the what we were coming up with was that there was a sort of lifelong estrogen exposure uh, that might be affecting your reproductive aging and i thought that when we um had the data to look at um menopause on later life cognition which we did in the last it was one of the last papers i first authored we would actually show that once you'd um adjusted for many of the mediating factors that would not show up that relationship wouldn't show up anymore and what we found um it's published in neurology what we found if i can remember rightly is that even adjusting for all the different factors that we now know also affect uh menopause and cognition um, there was still a, a small impact on verbal memory of and search speed, I think, of um, of your early uh, of your childhood um, cognition. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, of your there was still an effect. I beg your pardon of menopause, age at menopause on your later life cognition, even when you adjusted for the childhood cognition. So I think that you know there are certainly some factors that a change with well, there's certainly some factors that change with all kinds of hormonal exposures. And I think working out whether this is an age related to decline or something to do with a hormone change or and whether it's, you know, what's whether it's still there when you look at the sort of classic um, early life factors, I think those are really, um, I think you just get different, you know, there are different examples. So for uh, just a more general point, I would make like when you're looking at education and childhood and, and cognition, you'll find that education is a stronger risk factor for the cardiometabolic outcomes, suggesting it's more of a behavioral pathway. And the cognition was more uh, of, had more of an impact on the physical capability and the menopause type pathways, again, suggesting more of an underlying sort of hormonal mechanism. So that's what makes it interesting. There isn't just one path that fits all. And it's, I mean, it makes it interesting for research. It makes it slightly harder when you want to do general policy recommendations from it. <laughs> and I think the other thing you need to think about, or what you need to think about much more, and people are now have programs on this is, um, who are the people who are resilient? Who are the people who, despite these, you know, bad things happening to them of different types, end up doing jolly well for themselves? And if we can learn a little bit about them, um, that may well help us to how best to intervene. And we need to intervene at all stages. Uh, some in, in intervene for everybody and some things to intervene for people who seem to be, you know, having an accelerated decline. And we talk about that a lot in the Sapir report, if you're interested um, and I actually wondered, as uh, maybe I can have my lot, a last question, as Rita, if Rita's still on the line, um, um, I wondered, if, I, I haven't looked through fully the, the new report that you mentioned last week, but I noticed the Sapir report's not been cited at all. And, and I wondered if you even knew about it or whether people know about it. It was um, called um, Transforming the Future of Aging, I think was the, um, and it was a very big you know, pulling all the evidence together and looking at all the um, uh, interventions that would be useful across um, that aging spectrum. Personally, I, I didn't uh, came across this, this report up to now, so I don't know if it's publicly available. Yes, yes. So I can send you the link if you like. And um, yes, uh, that kind. Yeah, that was my sort of I was a co-chair of that. So we spent a lot of time after I retired working on that report. Okay, thank you very much for the, the answer and the link to, to what this report. 
I don't think uh, Professor Sadana is still uh, here. Oh, that's um, all right. I can. I'll, I'll be in touch with her anyway. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's uh, ten past uh, uh, twelve. Uh, perhaps. Oh, she's still here. <laughs> Perhaps a, a last question on the chat from uh, Christophe Villa. I don't know if, if you are here, Christophe, and want to to ask your question or so the question is about factors that have different impacts over the life course, and sometimes a positive impact at some at uh, yeah at a time uh, over the life course and the reverse. Uh, later on, for for yeah. instance, obesity. Yeah, uh, obesity the, is definitely. Yeah, the yeah. example that he 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 puts here is obesity turned out to be rather a protective factor against COVID mortality in older patients, mm -hmm. although it had been proven as a as an, uh, a risk factor in in middle age adults for uh, disease severity. I think that's a really good example, um, and. Uh, the other example I was just going to say is dropped out of my head. Um, and sort of, I mean, we know that the, like, the, I, I don't know how it relates in the, the COVID patients, but, you know, blood pressure and the is a changes its um, impact. Uh, midlife blood pressure is much more worrying, I think, than later life blood pressure. But, um, and um, what was the other one I was just going to remember? Oh, well, there's also... And we've done, like, for example, looking at the genetic markers. So, for example, genetic markers of obesity and an obesity score. Um, and two of those gen genes um, uh, I really have an effect much, uh, much, which is much stronger in early life. And then uh, and it and it and it um, wanes in later life. Um, and I think I also showed in the grip strength, I were mentioned, um, and I think it's worth mentioning again, that the you know, factors in earlier life didn't affect midlife grip, but they then really affected uh, grip strength later in life because grip strength became somewhat of a different indicator, you know, became more like picking up people who are frail. Um, you know, in midlife, you've still got men who've been working in uh, physical jobs all their lives, you know, often in the from the more poorer classes, and they have jolly good grip strength. But what happens is, I think they lose their grip strength faster, and in later life, grip strength is is something that means something different and can be very relevant for um, um, assessing people's health in later life. Um, so that I think it's a really interesting question, and I, I I wasn't aware. I'm going to go and look now for papers, and maybe he could send me a paper, Christoph, about uh, how obesity is protective in older COVID patients, because I think that's really important. Um, uh, obesity definitely changes its um, its stripes over over the life course. Okay, thank you very much. I think we we will uh, stop here, and. Uh, um... Thank you very much for having a thank you from Christophe on the chat for having okay. a, uh, for for this presentation. It was really interesting and as as usual, it uh, raises a, a, a more lot questions and answers. <laughs> for the questions, yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. Many things to okay. think about. Okay. All right. Thank you. So bye bye. Have a nice day. Bye.